It's, uh, welcome to the December 22nd, 2020 meeting of the Wolf Hill Budget Committee. Uh, my name is John McDonald. During the COVID-19 coronavirus crisis, and in accordance with Governor Sinuda's emergency order number 12, pursuant to Executive Order number 2020-04, this board is authorized to meet electronically. However, the Budget Committee has jointly decided to proceed with a hybrid meeting format, allowing for members of the public and board to attend and participate in the meeting in person or virtually. In accordance with RSC 91A colon 23, the board has three members joining the meeting remotely, which the public body has the authorization to allow. At this time, I'd like to take a roll call vote of all members present for those participating virtually. Please indicate your location and if you have any other individuals present in the room with you. Okay, Bob Tuffer. Yes, I'm uh, present in a room in my house uh, by myself. Okay, John Burt. Present here and I have nobody in the house but myself. Matt Plash. I'm here. Okay, Bob Loman is excused. Bob Mulholland. Excused. Brian Black. I'm uh, here at my uh, work location and there's no one else here. Thank you, Brian. Uh, Steve Johnson. Here. And Tom Bell. I believe uh, Mr. Bell was dealing with a uh, water issue at his residence. And uh, I'm John McDonald, I'm present. And we've got uh, Paul O'Brien, Board of Selectmen, is he with us? I am, sir. Paul, are you here? I'm present. Okay, how about Linda Murray? She's trying to. I'm present, I'm here. Okay, so they're talking and we can't hear them. Just so you know. Uh, Paul and Linda, I guess we can't hear you here. We're going to try to address that issue. Thank you. Oh. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you so much. Can you hear me too? Yes. All right, well said. Thank you. Okay, uh, the votes taken during this meeting will be via roll call vote for all members in accordance with emergency order number 12. For members of the public, this is confirmed that we are, number one, providing public access to the meeting by telephone, with additional access possibilities by video or electronic means through the go-to meeting. All members of the public and the board have the ability to communicate contemporaneously during this meeting through go-to meeting platform, and the public has access to contemporaneously listen, and if necessarily, participate in this meeting through dialing the following number, 1-571-317, 3122, followed by the audio access code of 888-209-605, or by video following the directions of the Town of Wolfboro website, posted on the home page under the virtual town meeting log inf information page. Providing public notice of the necessary information for accessing the meeting, we previously gave notice to the public of how to access the meeting in person or using the go-to meeting, and in the instructions are provided on the Town of Wolfboro website at wolfboronh.us on the virtual town meeting login information page. Providing a mechanism for the public to alert the body, the public body during the meeting if there's a problem with access. If anybody has a problem accessing the meeting via phone or computer, please immediately call 603-486-2692 or email h-e-n-d-r-i-c-k-s-o-n dot l-e-e-a-n-n at gmail.com. In the event that the public is unable to access the meeting, we will adjourn the meeting and have it rescheduled at a later time. Okay, tonight uh, we're going to look at the Assessing Budget Conservation Commission, uh, Fire Department Capital Outlay, uh, Library Capital Outlay, uh, revisit to the Public Works Department and the Water and Sewer Department. Uh, Mr. Tom Manager, do you have anything you want to bring up before we start? No, I'm all set to go, Mr. Chairman. Okay, thank you, sir. Okay, let's take a look at the uh, library capital outlay request. So, Mr. Chairman, the, the librarian, Cindy Scott, is here. I believe she has a trustee with her as well. Um, this capital outlay is for an upgrade to their uh, aging website. Um, they are anticipating uh, offsetting revenues 
which would be coming in um, in the year 2021 um, to basically um, pay for this expense, but we have to budget it nonetheless. With that said, I'll hand it over to Cindy so she can speak on its behalf and any questions you may have. Yeah, th thank you, Mr. Town Manager. Go ahead, Cindy. Okay, can, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Can you hear me? Okay, great. Um, so basically with the code, we have definitely found that our website is not capable of dealing with all of the new things that we're trying to do on it. And while we had planned on upgrading it sometime in the next two years, that we've had to move up some of our technology plans. Uh, we do um, expect to receive a donation that is going to cover the cost of this. We have talked to website designer to get some estimates on what it would cost and 15,000 includes the design of the website as well as the development and the building of the of the website so um we we just need permission to spend money that um we're going to have it's not going to affect the tax rate I take it, Cindy, that your uh, board is all, all set with us, is going to approve this, and it's all set to go with them? Yes, they've already um, approved uh, doing doing this as part of the budget process before it gets to all of you folks. Okay, thank you. Uh, does anyone have any questions of Cindy concerning the uh, capital LA request? Seeing none, can I get a motion to uh, accept the uh, request for website replacement at a cost of fifteen thousand dollars? So moved. And a second. Second. Okay. Any further discussion? Hearing none or seeing none, uh, this is a request by the uh, library for web replacement uh, for 2021 at a cost of uh, $15,000. Anybody have any questions or anything? Okay, bureau call vote. Bob Tuffer? Yes. John Burrett? Yes. Matt Plash? Yes. Brian Black? Yes. Steve Johnson? Yes. And John McDonald votes yes. That motion uh, passes. Thank you. Thank you, Cindy. Hey, John. Yes, sir. Uh, a few weeks back, um, we discussed a uh, what I felt was a, uh, a salary discrepancy among department heads, and I identified uh, three long-time serving department heads who I felt uh, were lagging behind in salary a little bit. Uh, one was um, Brenda LaPointe, the second was Pat Waterman, and the third was Cindy Scott. And uh, we made motions that evening to increase uh, salaries on Brenda LaPointe and Pat Waterman. And I was wondering if we could take care of uh, the uh, Cindy Scott's vote uh, this evening, or should we push that out to uh, when we review the budget? Uh, I guess I'll get a question for the town manager. Who sets the library salaries? Um, that would be under the trustees of the library, which I believe there still may be a representative at in attendance. Okay, is there anyone from the library trustees with us tonight? John, I, I, if we do this, I would make the motion uh, pending approval by the uh, Board of uh, uh, Library Trustees. Well, I was just seeing if there's anyone with us tonight, the trustees that might be able to give their uh, give their opinion or the thoughts on it. <clears throat> okay, Bob. If you any kind of motion you want to do is fine. If you want to make one and see if you get a second. Okay. So uh, as I said, uh, I uh, Jim Pinio had given us a list of all the department heads and their salaries. And uh, upon examining it, 
I, I discovered uh, three department heads who uh, was, have been serving Wolfboro for a very long time, all three uh, persons, very hardworking individuals. Uh, we gave two and a half percent raises to uh, uh, Pat Waterman and uh, Brenda LaPointe. In fact, I think we bumped up Pat Waterman to uh, the same number as Brent, Brenda LaPointe. And uh, I, I also felt that Cindy Scott, uh, being a longtime library director, has uh, worked very hard over the last 10 years, and she basically was uh, one of the main driving forces behind this uh, terrific renovation. So I, um, I felt that uh, her salary should be brought up a little bit, and I would hope uh, going forward in the future that uh, Everybody, uh, uh, everybody's salaries will be looked at, so nobody falls behind. So with that in mind, I make a motion to increase Cindy Scott's salary 2.5% uh, from $68,472 to $70,184, pending approval by the Library Board of Trustees. Okay, is there a second to that motion? I'll second that. Seconded by John Burrett. Any discussion? Mr. Chairman, I have a couple of comments. I think that uh, uh, while Bob's uh, motion is laudable, I think that uh, uh, I'd rather wait until we get some word from the trustees, and also I think we uh, might be usurping some of uh, the town manager's uh, purview. I think um, I'd, I'd, I'd rather see it on a discussion basis uh, bef before we get to this point as far as budgets with the town manager, and maybe we can make that happen in the future, but um, I'm not in favor of this motion at this point. Thank you, Steve. Any other discussion? Okay, uh, seeing that a hearing, then we'll do a roll call vote. Uh, Bob Tuffer? Yes. John Burt? Yes. Matt Flash? Yes. Brian Black? Oh, yes. Steve Johnson? No. And John McDonald votes yes. Motion passes. That, Bob, that number is 70,184, correct? John, that, that is correct. And I will uh, reach out to uh, one or uh, a couple of the uh, uh, library trustees uh, to explain uh, my uh, methodology in this. Okay, very good, thank you. As I did on the library, okay, let's move on to uh, assessing. So Mr. Chairman, the assessing budget you will see is up slightly compared to the 2020 budget. However, it's very much in line with the 2019 budget, um, if you recall. In 2020, um, there was a reevaluation, which meant some of our uh, contracted services within the operating budget um, were not there. Um, additionally, you'll, when you look at this, you'll see some uh, overtime reductions and uh, some equipment reductions. Um, but all in all, this line is this budget is very much in line with the uh, 2019 budget. Um, before the reevaluation. Very good, thank you. Let's see if I can bring it up on my the, the budget on my phone. I don't seem to have it in my book. Would you like a copy of it? I would love that. Yes. If you get next to copy, John, you have a book. Oh, thank you, sir. I've got it here. Okay, uh, 100 series.
Mr. Town Manager, if you can just help me, that, that uh, one hourly wages, why did that fluctuate in 2020? If you can just refresh my memory. From 2020 to 2021? Yeah, where 2019 it was 42,828, and then 2020 it was the 46,569, and now it's down to 43,209. Was that just due to some overtime or something? Or? Uh, so th there is a reduction in overtime in the, the overall budget of the 100 series. Additionally, uh, if you recall, the 2019, excuse me, the 2020 operating budget was budgeted for 53 weeks. Right, okay. This um, budget for 2021 is budgeted for 52 weeks, and this represents a single employee under the collective bargaining agreement. So there wasn't a whole lot of movement relative to the 2020 raise. Very good, thank you, sir. Uh, 200 series. Three hundred series. There's going to be enough money in the abatement processing there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so one of the the items that um, relative to the the reevaluation, some of those abatements could fall under the uh, contract for the reevaluation. So the, the provider um, of our services feels very comfortable with that number. Thank you, sir. 400 series. Five hundred series. Six hundred series. Eight hundred series. That appears to be it for assessing. Any questions for the assessing department? John, uh, not a question, but just a, re a statement. Yeah. I, I was wondering uh, if there was any way we could uh, move out uh, this, uh, the cost of revaluation. Uh, this past year, um, the town manager and the board of selectmen decided to uh, write a warrant article to request the funding for the, uh, uh, to pay for the uh, assessment. And uh, I felt that was a, a very unwise move because uh, revaluations are uh, required under state law and you have to do it and you have to fund it. And if you put it out for a warrant article and the warrant article fails, then you don't have the funding to do it and you're breaking the law. In 2010 and 2015, the, the uh, funding for the revaluation was uh, definitely in the operating budget. I, I checked on that. I believe that's where it belongs. And uh, I'm just wondering if there's a way we could uh, smooth out this expense somehow. Jim, do you want to address that? Yeah, uh, I would like to, Mr. Chairman. I, I agree with you wholeheartedly, um, Bob. One of my plans going into the 2022 budget process will be to establish a capital reserve fund for exactly that. Um, we have got a lot on the plate right now relative to warrant articles. Um, so that's why you won't see it in front of you in the 2021 warrant. But my intention is to bring forward an establishment of a capital reserve in 2022. I hope that answers your Thank question. You, Thank you. Okay, anything else for assessing? Okay, let's move on to uh, Conservation Commission. Anybody from the Conservation Commission here this evening? Uh, yes, hello, I am here. Um, can everybody hear me okay? 
Yes, we can. Thank you. Oh, great. Hi. Um, good evening to all members of the Budget Committee and Select Board and Mr. Town Manager and the general public. Um, I'm Lenore uh, Clark. I'm the chair of the Conservation Commission. And I want to thank you all for allowing me the opportunity to present our proposed budget for 2021. And with me are um, with my vice chair, Dan Coons, and member Brian Gifford. Um, and just as a quick reacquaintance, the Conservation Commission were established by Governor King back in 1963. We are comprised of seven volunteer members, two volunteer alternates, and one paid part-time administrative staff um, who we share with you guys. Um, the Conservation Commission is requesting an increase to our budget for next year. And we appreciate that this is um, an especially tough ask this year. And I would just like to assure you all that um, it is because it is urgent. And it's mostly because of one line item. And as we start to go through all our different line items, I have a brief five minute slideshow presentation that will explain our position a little further. Um, in the meantime, I would like to highlight some of our accomplishments from 2020. The pandemic did not, it slowed us down a little bit in the spring and then we just got right back in and kept going. And Leanne and I joked a few times that this was probably one of our busiest years ever. At least it felt like that at times. Uh, we complete, in my mind, the biggest accomplishment we had was completing the transfer of land and the conservation easement on White Face Mountain in North Wolfboro, which permanently protects over 140 acres of unfragmented forest land. We are currently working on acquiring two more parcels of land that are adjoining the easement, so that will expand our easement area by roughly another 10 acres and will give us full control of the land that has the parking lot. Um, the public has been using the parking lot to access our hiking trail quite a lot this year. Um, as you can imagine, with the pandemic, everybody wanted to get outside and get on the trails. Um, we contributed to the Lakes Region Conservation Trust effort to acquire over 100 acres on Mount Pleasant, which is mostly in Tufton Borough, but crosses the town line into Wolfboro, and more importantly, uh, will protect some of our town's water supply, um, because the headwaters of Beach Pond are located up there. We worked with an Eagle Scout candidate to build a kiosk at the trailhead to our Willie Brook multi-use trail system off the Cotton Valley Rail Trail and to blaze the trails. We are currently working on um, building an additional mile of trail out there. And again, that trail system, from anecdotal evidence, was very well used and well appreciated this year, perhaps more than any other. We assisted the Eastern Lakes Region Housing Coalition, who amend needed to amend a conservation easement on their property so that they could move forward with their project to provide affordable housing um, for the town's workforce. And then we placed a conservation easement on their adjoining land, which permanently protects a small wetland complex. And most recently, we have formed an informal partnership with the Wolfboro Tuftoboro Land Bank. Um, James Nuff is here, actually, present, representing the land bank. We are attempting a comprehensive effort to tackle our town's upland invasive species issue, and that I will get to that more later with my slideshow. Um, and at this point, I'd just like to point out that I um, apologize, but we just realized that we have a minor error in our proposed budget and in our uh, year-to-date expenses. It's in the 800 series under professional development. So my sincerest apologies for that. And if you want, we can discuss that now or we can start to go through the line items and discuss it when we get there. Um, your, your pleasure. Okay, thank you very much. What we'll do is uh, we'll go through each line item, each, uh, and then if someone has some questions, we'll direct them to you if that's okay. Absolutely. Excellent. Okay, let's uh, start at the 100 series. Two hundred series. Three hundred series. John, I have a quick question of Will Noor. Go ahead, John. Uh, what is uh, covered under this line? It's not defined very well for me. I'm, I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? That was a little, the voice quality was a little fuzzy there. Could you repeat that, please? It's line 399. Uh, um, maintenance other, what, what does that entail? 
Um, line 399. I'm, I'm sorry, I see a line 311 for consultants. I don't see a line 399. Well, for, no, I'm sorry. It's 490. I, I'm, I'm ahead of myself. Oh, okay. Under other, oh, okay, sure. Um, I'll, I'll address that when we get there, if, if, if it pleases the court. Thank you. Okay, now we'll go to the 400 series where I think John's question is going to be. <laughs> oh, okay, sure. So other property services. So your question is what we use that money for. Um, we use that to maintain some of the town properties. For ex as, um, a, an example, we maintain the property at Goodwin Basin, and this year we had a diseased tree right on the edge of the property that was overhanging the abutters' uh, brand newly renovated cabins, and he requested us to take it down before it fell down and damaged the cabin. So that's an example of what we would use that line for. Um, we have used it for snow plowing in the pet. Last year we um, plowed the Bill Ray conservation easement area parking lot. Um, we plow out the front bay parking lot. Um, just as some examples, we, we have to mow Goodwin Basin, and the cost for that has been going up each year. Um, so. Does that help? Does that answer your question? Thank you. Yes, I do have a question on the next line of ten thousand dollars. Oh, I'm sure you. Yep. <laughs> Are we there yet? Should I continue on? Or? Yes. Go ahead, please. For uh, line four nine one. Okay. So this, um, with the permission of the chair, I would like to now present a brief five-minute slideshow, if I may. Certainly. Go ahead. And bear with me as I uh, navigate my way through this, the new go-to meeting. Uh, and just a quick introduction while my um, slideshow opens up. Um, it is, um, we are requesting a brand new line item, as I mentioned, to begin a comprehensive effort to tackle the town's invasive species. And I know that you're all somewhat uh, familiar with it from having um, you know, listened to the milfoil committee in the past, which is um, milfoil being an aquatic invasive species. We are looking at the uplands or terrestrial invasive species of plants um, and trees. There we go. Um, and just as a very quick refresher, an invasive species is most often a non-native species that spreads from a point of introduction to become naturalized and negatively alters its new environment. Basically, it takes over. Um, and these impacts include imperiling rare species, altering wildlife habitat, reducing forest and ag production, damaging personal property, human health problems, and loss of biodiversity. And I will uh, explain some of those uh, a little bit more. Um, perhaps the most obvious one that you can see driving around town is the oriental bittersweet, which is introduced here in the mid to late 1800s. Um, the bittersweet was planted in part because it grows so well. It, it grows very fast, it grows very thick, and farmers were using it to edge their properties to keep their sheep hemmed in, uh, amongst other uses, I believe. The bittersweet climbs trees, power lines, and utility poles, and it adds excess weight so that these things are now uh, more susceptible to damage during storms. The picture on this slide is not actually on town property. It's on the school district property on McManus Road. And this is damage that happened to a stand of young uh, white birch trees right after not the most recent storm, but two storms ago. So this just happened um, a few weeks ago. The, um, the bittersweet shades out the understory and it girdles tree trunks. So it kills native plants by preventing sunshine from reaching them. And it literally strangles trees. Um, trees have you know small tubules in them to transport water and nutrients. And it literally chokes them out. Now I mentioned bio loss of biodiversity being an important factor. Um, Biodiversity describes the variety of life on Earth, and it's one of the things that gives us our resilience. Its loss disrupts the functioning of ecosystems, making them more vulnerable to disturbances and less able to supply us humans with needed services. And there have been six uh, main points, um, or, or uh, 
effects in global loss of biodiversity, but I'm going to focus on the second group of three because I think that is directly relevant to Wolfboro. And number one of those is an increase in the number of disease-carrying animals. The bittersweet is so thick that predators can't get in there to prey on the smaller animals that carry ticks. And as we all know, Lyme disease is uh, quite prevalent in our area. Um, we live in a town that is, has a tourism-based economy. And um, quite frankly, some of our town properties are turning uh, less attractive. So we are losing sight of nature. And economically, um, you know, you're the budget committee, so I thought this might speak to some of you especially. Um, globally, the value of the loss of biodiversity is measured in trillions of dollars. And here in our own country, the New Hampshire Department of Ag says that the adverse economic impact from invasive species currently exceeds $100 billion annually. The problem is so bad that our House Legislature, or excuse me, our House of Representatives passed the Invasive Species Act in the early 2000s and gave the authority to the New Hampshire Department of Ag Markets and Food to, um, to preserve, uh, I lost my slide, sorry. To preserve, I have to move this, and protect New Hampshire's economic integrity and ecological stability. Thank you for hanging in with me there. We hired a certified master arborist who is one of the very few licensed herbicide applicators in our state. There are less than 10 of these folks. Um, he came out and walked our town's garden property and Front Bay Park property and immediately identified seven or eight species, depending on which property we were at, including um, the invasive bittersweet. And here's a picture again of that um, site on the school district property that just gives you a better sense of what happens after a storm or what can happen. Here's the young birch trees completely destroyed. And now I'm going to take you on a very short pictorial walk through Front Bay Park. You can see how the bittersweet is starting to drag down our young trees. And keep in mind that Front Bay Park is one of the few ADA accessible trail systems in the state. So this is what we're inviting people to come see and come spend time on. Here's a tree in Front Bay Park that has been girdled by invasive bittersweet, and you can see how thick the vine is. And it, again, as I said, it adds extra weight, and then when windstorms hit, the trees are more susceptible to being blown over. Um, th it also affects the view. This is the view from the Front Bay Park trail overlooking the wetlands. Uh, it's literally blocking the view. And here's a view from Pine Street. Uh, that's Dan, that's our vice chair, marking the surveyor pen. But this is what you see as you drive along um, Pine Street. That's the edge of the Front Bay Park property. And now here we are at Town's Garden property. Same thing, it's a big tangle. And I'll leave you with this picture. And again, these were all just taken in the past couple of months, October and November. This is also Town's Garden. Um, our certified arborist has come in with a quote. Um, this is going to be an ongoing effort, but the first step at both properties to correctly tackle this um, is going to, he came in with a quote of 17,400. So we are asking for 400, or excuse me, for 10,000 of that to not allow this to happen. This was gleaned off the web. This is not one of our town sites, but this is where our properties are headed. Um, he estimates that in about 15 years, the sites are going to be completely overtaken with bittersweet. And when our sites get to this state, at that point, there's nothing to do except enter a process of reclamation and rewilding, which basically means bringing in heavy machinery and completely mowing down and chipping the site and starting again from scratch, which is, as you can imagine, uses a lot more resources than what it is that we're proposing. So with that, um, I would just like to leave you with this final thought, and um, I will take any further questions or comments at this point. Uh, any questions for Lenore? I just have one question for you. Is this $10,000 just a one-shot deal, or is this going to be something every year? No, this would be for, uh, we're, we're looking at this as an ongoing issue. This is going to be, it's not going to just go away, although um, our arborist did say that the initial outlay tends to be pricier, and then as you get the site under control, it becomes less resource intensive. So it wouldn't be forever, but it will be more than just one year. What do you project is what the cost would be to do what you want to do from start to completion? 
I'm sorry, I actually don't have an answer for that at this point. He just gave us, um, you know, step one for these two sites. Um, I, yeah, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't know. Okay. If I, I mean, my best guess, he probably could get it start to get it under control in five years. So, um, you want to guess? We could guess at fifty thousand. Uh, Steve, you have a question? Yeah, I have a question for you. Uh, so the 10000 is going to go to this one contractor, Arborist, who's going to come into Front Bay Park and deal with the, the issue there as much as he can for the amount that he set, correct? Uh, to both to Front Bay Park and to the town garden property, which was uh, donated to the town in the early 1900s by Greenleaf Clark. Uh, for the benefit of the um, agricultural education of our local students. So the both properties. I agree with you that Venice Wheat's a problem um, and should be addressed. I just wonder uh, how, if you eradicate it, uh, I mean, do, is, how, sure is he uh, once he goes in and does his job that he's solved, solved the problem there? Um, he claims that at the smaller, what he refers to both Front Bay Park and the town's gardens as a park-like setting. And he does say, he claims that 100% eradication is possible. When you look at larger areas such as Sewell Woods, for example, there he said it's more, and I understand that we don't own Sewell Woods, that's owned by Lakes Region Conservation Trust, but we do hold the easement on one of those parcels. And he said there it gets to be more, you have to figure out what your goals are. For example, you could manage it for wildlife habitat, and you go for maybe 85% eradication. But at the smaller park-like settings, he said it is possible to bring it under control, but it will likely require um, ongoing, a certain amount of ongoing maintenance, but certainly not as much in future years as it will take right now. Mr. Chairman. Yes, go ahead, please. Yeah, is this a physical removal process or a chemical treatment or a combination of both, Lenor? Combination. Mr. Chairman, can I add something? Certainly. Um, from a uh, comprehensive uh, attack of this program, the uh, Wolfboro and Tuftonboro Land Bank has been particularly interested in appealing to a, a wide approach, a town-wide approach to this problem. Um, any of you that have walked in Sewell Woods can see just how bad the damage can be when this is left unchecked. We've now had an issue with blowdowns um, caused by excess weight uh, and strangulation of uh, the younger trees in Sewell that has caused uh, considerable uh, damage not only to the trails but also to the uh, ambiance of that, uh, that setting. Um, as Lenore mentioned, this is an ongoing process uh, the initial application, the chemical application, is only one step in this long-range process that is going to take quite a while to get under control, um, particularly with an area, as Lenore mentioned, as big as Sewell Woods. But if we don't begin this process now, uh, we're doomed to see the kind of damage that you see in Sewell Woods now. Thank you. Okay, thank yeah. you, sir. Yes, Bob. Yes, uh, when you mentioned Town Gardens, uh, I'm assuming that's that uh, town-owned property at the end of Goodrich Road? Yes, correct. That is correct. So so I'm downstream of, uh, from that, uh, pro uh, probably uh, roughly uh, 20 acres. Uh, so behind me is the, uh, the, uh, the nursing home has about 15 acres. The town gardens uh, is probably maybe about six acres. There's a four-acre plot next to the town gardens. And um, that stuff is all over the place. Between t town gardens and me, I have a lot of it on my property. 
You know, so what I'm wondering is if you if you eradicate this in the town gardens, you know, is this going to keep coming back? Like from from where I am and behind me, is it once again going to encroach on the town gardens? This this, this could be a, a, a an impossible battle, I, I would say. And I, 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 I'm just curious about that. That's, thank you. That's an excellent question. And um, the arborist. Uh, he sort of, he almost cut that one off at the pass. His suggestion when he was first came out to view the site was to start an outreach campaign where we contacted all of the abutters at each of the properties to explain what the problem is. And he said, basically, you out, try to get their buy-in, request permission for him and his crew to extend over the property line a few feet to tackle the invasives so that that doesn't happen. And we did that, although this was all, um, it was very rushed. This all kind of came about, came to a head in just the past, you know, month and a half, really. And I immediately heard back, I would say, from a, a few of the property owners at each site that said, oh my gosh, yes, please, we, we invite you not only to feet, come on to my property and you know, take care of it if you like, which obviously we can't um, promise that. But his point was, um, you bring up an excellent point. And he said, once they see, even those that haven't yet bought in, when they see what can be accomplished, it kind of gets people interested in doing it on their own property. So it's an opportunity for an educational outreach. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any more questions on the 400 series? Uh, 500 series? 600 series? Eight hundred series, and that's it for the conservation commission uh, budget. Mr. Chair, if I may, the eight hundred series is where we found our an error recently, um, and I, I again I really apologize if this slipped us um, our attention. We, for some reason, the copy I have in front of me says um, request, that we're requesting zero dollars in under professional development. Uh, we would like to have the one hundred and fifty dollars added back in. Um, it also, in my budget appropriation report, incorrectly stated that we only spent $35 in that line item. We had actually spent $70 this past year. And again, my apologies. It's, it's, it's the year of COVID, and I've had my kids home with me most of the time since March, and uh, sometimes I'm white knuckling it through part of this year. Mr. Chairman, I'll make a motion to level fund line 820 at 150. Okay, is there a second? I'll second it. Okay, the motion is to uh, professional development, lower fund that's the same as last year, which was $150. Any further discussion? Seeing and hearing none, this will be a roll call vote. Bob Tuffer? Yes. John Burrett? Yes. Uh, Matt Flash? Yes. Uh, Brian Block? Yes. Steve Johnson? Yes. And John McDonald votes yes. And the motion passes. Okay, do you have any more questions? John, uh, yes, I have sir. a comment. Uh, could I make a comment? Uh, yes. And this relates to the bittersweet. Uh, and I'm just wondering if other options have been explored. And not to say that you shouldn't do this. It needs to be done. We had a huge problem with it on our farm. And the goats took care of it. They just ate it off. Uh, they love it. Really? Goats? Goats. Uh, we have 15 goats now. And we don't have any more bittersweet at all. You know, we have 60 acres of, of trees and, and bushes. And the goats just ate it off. So it's a quick and easy way to take care of it without poison if, if it's manageable in that way. So it's not hard to do. But, and I know people do it in other towns. They've done it in other towns. You see them on the highways sometimes. And it's it's, it's a, a more environmentally friendly way to get rid of it. So, and if you want to borrow some goats, I'm happy to oblige. 
good. I appreciate that, and I agree. We, uh, my presentation was heavily focused on invasive bittersweet, um, but there were also six or seven other invasive species, including Norway maple. Yeah. Um, so it's more than just the bittersweet, but uh, that is interesting food for thought, for sure. Okay, uh, thank you folks from the uh, Conservation Commission. We're all set, I guess. All right, thank you all very much. I really appreciate your time. I know you're busy, so thank you. We appreciate your Christmas. time also. Same to you, thank you. Okay, uh, let's take a look at the Fire Department of Capital Outlay. So, Mr. Chairman, you should have uh, two requests for capital outlay in front of you from the Fire Department. Uh, the first one is uh, a request for motors for the new boat. I believe the backup data that you have in front of you shows a complete refurbishment of the boat. Um, through the budget budgeting process, working with the Board of Selectmen, the determination was made to reduce that to exclusively the motors, to which I believe the Chief has requested $35,000 for that project. Um, with that said, I'll hand this over to the Chief to discuss his request uh, to initiate the rehab of Boat 1. Chief? Good evening, Chief. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, the the fire rescue boat uh, is 15 years old. And when it was purchased, it was uh, earmarked to have a 30-year lifespan. And 2021 was the midway uh, time where um, the department was going to look for refurbishment and repowering the boat. We're not talking about refurbishment this year because uh, we just agree, all agreed that we would do the repowering this year and do, and do the refurbishment at a later date. It's, we're not able to actually even schedule uh, the opportunity uh, to refurbish the boat until the following year. Uh, the vendor is not able to accommodate that. The motors are, uh, are E-Tech motors, one uh, 50 horsepower motors, and uh, we're proposing replacing them with 150 horsepower Mercury uh, four-stroke motors. That's basically the proposal for the boat for this year. I can, answer, I can tell you more, or I could answer questions, whatever it is your pleasure. I guess just for the town manager, uh, why can't we take this money out of the capital reserve or whatever? Uh, so, excellent question. Um, quite frankly, those funds are earmarked at this point for the replacement of the ladder truck, which you will be seeing a warrant article coming in front of you. Um, and there's simply not enough funds in that account to complete the purchase of the ladder truck alone. Um, so to bring this on, um, it, it simply was not programmed into that capital reserve account. I, I thought we saved some money when uh, we went from, got rid of one engine and went to the pickup truck, the heavy duty pickup truck with the, I don't know, the line in the back of that. Um, so that particular year, um, that was my first year here as chief, we reduced the appropriation from $196,000 to $122,000 um, because our appropriation was anticipated to be $155,000 and we spent about ninety. dollars um, So in a good faith effort, we reduced that appropriation that year for, for the taxpayers. Um, this is the third year. This has come in front of you, um, and it, it really does not fall into the capital reserve as far as for refurbishment. Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. We also, um, just as a reminder, provided uh, you, and I, I hope you got them, we did a capital outlay plan similar to the capital improvement plan for those items that are under 100,000 went out 10 years with those uh, in hopes that we could show all of the projects uh, going forward when the recommended time for replacement is. Uh, just to add, I did a little research on the, the old motors and I guess uh, 
they're no longer going to be sold or whatever service after this year. And uh, I guess one of the major expenses uh, also is the controls. Does this controls? Does this this quote in, include the new control system for it? The shifters and all that stuff. Do you know? Yes, I believe it does. And it also, um, right? Yes. And this was uh, the state bid information that I gave you. These are consistent with the state bid. We would pursue the state bid for sure. Uh, this quote came from uh, was a dealer quote um, that was done uh, several months ago. From uh, I think we received a quote from uh, Melvin Village Marine for that price. So we know that the state quote. Uh, we would definitely pursue that with the time take to purchase it. Okay, so you, well. you didn't contact the, the marina that I, the information that I sent you to get the state bid? Uh, we had been in touch with uh, Marine Patrol on this, yes. Okay, I, I sent you some information, a, a contact. I think it was a marina down at Portsmouth that has the state bid for oh. Mercury Motors. And right. I'd asked you to maybe see, compare the prices. And you, did you do that or not do that? No, sir. I, I, I would be more than happy to do that. How many times a, a year do you, do you think that we uh, use the fire boat? Well, um, the boat's usually in the water between April and December. Um, we're on it. Uh, very frequently for uh, scheduled monthly training, shift training, and you're talking about emergencies. I don't have those statistics in front of me. I could get them for you if you want me to. Um, pr predominantly during the summertime, we're uh, uh, out fairly frequently with that, um, but I'd be happy to get those numbers for you. I'm just curious. It's a, I'm just looking at the expense, and I, I know that we want to, to be all about safety and so on and, and have the right precaution. But anyway, to John's point, as far as like uh, the cost and expense of getting to uh, get that get that to a the lowest figure that we possibly can. So the two the two things I'm looking at, uh, the thirty two thousand eight is for just the motors and the eighty three is the refurbishing of the current boat. Correct. So, so the the request is for thirty five thousand for the the replacement of the motors. The initial request was for eighty three thousand one hundred and sixty six dollars. That got reduced at the board of selectmen level. The thirty two thousand eight hundred that you're looking at that's a that's a second capital outlay item. Okay, so we're looking at thirty two eight, and that's the motors. No, we're looking at thirty five. I beg your pardon. Why am I looking at thirty two eight? I believe that is the cardiac monitor. That's the second item. Oh, okay. Brian, are you, are you still on with us? I am here. Can you give us uh, some information on the, those prices, what you think about those prices? Yeah, I, I think you're definitely uh, in the, the ballpark there at 35000 uh, I don't have specific numbers in front of me, but uh, uh, particularly if you're in, including uh, uh, the uh, the wiring harnesses and the controls and the labor to uh, do the installation, um, yeah, I think you probably got uh, you know a pretty decent price right there. I also know at one time there was uh, talk about uh, the fire department contacting uh, Eastern, because I believe uh, Eastern uh, was able to take the candle or repower as well, uh, whereas they're the builders of the boat. But, uh, so I don't know if that's happening, but uh, definitely, uh, you know, running the uh, the E-Tex is, uh, uh, you're, you're taking a, a big chance because you have a breakdown, you're not going to be able to get them repaired any longer. Uh, Brunswick uh, 
is no longer uh, producing those outboards. Uh, so it makes a whole lot of sense to uh, go with something that uh, is serviceable, uh, both locally and uh, globally. Brian, are you, are you folks a Mercury dealer? We are. If you have access uh, as a dealer to what the state bid is for Mercury Motors? Uh, yeah, I, I've not been exposed to that, but I can certainly uh, make the inquiry. Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. Yeah, I, I actually have access to the state bids as well. Um, and quite frequently when, when purchase orders and, and items come in front of me, um, I also look at the state bid to get a, a cost comparison. Um, and quite frankly, sometimes we're able to get better pricing outside of state bid, um, specifically with, with vehicles, um, based on what might be on the lot. Um, however, I have not researched motors, but I do have access to that. Okay, thank you. Uh, any more questions? On the John, if I may uh, just uh, add that uh, I know when we talked uh, previously uh, with the fire department representatives about uh, going to Eastern, uh, that was when they were considering a, a refurbishment of the boat as well, because there were certain uh, items on there that involved fiberglassing and, and uh, going with a different pump and so on and so forth, that it would be uh, definitely appropriate for them to uh, contact uh, Eastern, but uh, just to repower uh, can be done elsewhere. So you, you think Eastern may offer the same type of service? Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, but uh, like I said at the time, they were also looking at uh, some structural changes uh, to the boat that uh, uh, I guess is not in consideration right now. Now, if there was an issue with the motors, yeah, I guess you folks would, even though you didn't sell the product, you would still do the warranty work on them as a, as a dealer, a local dealer? Oh, sure. Yeah. Okay. Okay, uh, any other questions for the uh, capital outlay? I'd like to do a motion. It's a motion to table this until such time as uh, we can find out some more prices, especially should, all it takes is a phone call. All it takes is a phone call to get uh, the state prices or also to contact Easton to see if they can do it any more reasonably. And that's my motion. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Any further discussion? I'll talk to uh, talk to my motion. Uh, I just want to make sure we're getting the best the best deal. If we can save a couple thousand dollars or five hundred dollars or whatever, I just would feel more comfortable that we check with the state, see what the bid is, because I know Marine Patrol buys a ton of motors every year for their boats, and. Uh, just to get an idea of what the difference is. This may be a great price, I, I, I don't know. I don't know, but that's why I'm, I want to table it for now, and we can bring it up as soon as uh, the chief gets the information. Any more discussion? Excuse me? John, I can certainly do uh, my research from here as well, and if uh, they want to entertain uh, you know, a quote from us, uh, uh, just to compare, uh, I can make that happen as well. Yeah, that would be great. Thank you, Brian. If you guys could see what you can do too. Just just uh, things are tight this year, at least they are at my house, so. Okay, uh, anything else? Uh, there's a second capital outlay item uh, for the fire department. Um, okay, we're gonna vote on this motion right now. Oh, I apologize. Okay. Okay, this, uh, this motion is to table uh, the refurbishment of boat, now, uh, boat one. Uh, until such time as we provided with some additional information. Uh, Bob Tuffer? Yes. John Burt? Yes. Uh, Matt Plash? Yes. Uh, Brian Black? 
Yes. Steve Johnson? Yes. And John McDonough votes yes. Motion passes. Uh, Leanne, can you schedule this for and let the chief know what the deadline is? Great, thank you. Okay, and the second request is uh, from the fire department, and it's for a, uh, let's see here, looks like a defibrillator. The cost of uh, $32,800. Uh, go ahead, Chief. We're, uh, Chief, you're muted. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We are in the process of our recommendations to replace an existing cardiac 12-lead monitor defibrillator, which the department carries. Um, just for everyone who's uh, on the committee, this is not the def uh, defibrillator like you would see at the schools or an airport or something like that. It has that component in it, but it is also a 12-lead EKG, which allows um, our personnel uh, to do diagnostics uh, on patient and during patient care uh, with a 12-lead uh, blood pressure uh, and other diagnostic tools. The uh, unit that we're proposing is uh, uh, compatible with those at the hospital and around us and uh, basically we carry one of these on our first out engine and the rest of what we carry are AEDs that I was speaking about before. Uh, we're seeking to uh, replace this uh, with a Zoll. We've got two quotes uh, and, the, and the one that we're recommending is a Zoll. The cost of it is 32800 I think it's uh, pretty important. Uh, it's not just a matter of being able, it definitely, another benefit is when we're doing CPR, there's a component in there for uh, coaching and managing a CPR event. Um, there's a lot of things tied to this particular piece of equipment that allow our personnel to uh, provide better patient care. Uh, thank you, Chief. Any questions for the Chief? on the cardiac monitor defibrillator. And I, I have a question, John. Oh, go ahead, Bob. Uh, Chief, um, is uh, Stewart's uh, ambulance uh, primary responder in uh, town of Wolfboro? Yes, they are. Do you get, do you get to the scene of, uh, of sick calls uh, before them uh, in many events? Yes, we do. Okay, so. Um, it's back and forth. Okay, so if you uh, hook somebody up to this device, does that device uh, get transferred into the uh, transporting ambulance uh, and then return to you at a later time? Our, our, um, because we'd use the same device and we're currently not, we would be compatible with uh, the ambulance. We could just disconnect the, um, the leads and put them, you know, you know, connect them to their machine during transport or do as you said, we could transport our um, defibrillator monitor with the patient if, if that was more appropriate at the time. Yes. Okay, thank you. I just got a question, question for you, Chief. So this this piece of equipment currently exists on the ambulance, our town ambulances? Every, um, most every ambulance that's licensed carries uh, this as a basic diagnostic tool now, yes. Do you know if our folks have it? Oh, yes. Okay. So where would this piece of equipment be carried? Which, which one of your units? We generally carry it on engine one, our first response vehicle. Chairman? Yes, go ahead. Uh, Chief, uh, how old is the unit uh, that's be that it's being replaced? Um, can't answer that question. Uh, I think it's five years old. Is that about the use of life? What I can tell you is that the manufacturer is not supporting it any any longer. That's I, I can get you the year of uh, it was purchased, but I I'm sorry I can't tell, I can't say it right now for certain. But I can yeah, tell you this. I can, can tell you for sure that it, it won't. Pass its annual test is not supported any longer. 
trying to get a sense of what the useful life of this unit is. Um, I would say five to seven years because technology, it's not just wearing out, but it's also technological changes. Like for example, this new monitor can do three, five or 12 lead interpretation, uh, can do pulse oximetry, SpO2, blood pressure and tidal capnography uh, during a event when we're breathing for somebody. Uh, it has uh, the ability to do temperature. It can also send an EKG electro, uh, by Bluetooth to the hospital ahead of the patient delivery so they can see what the uh, rhythms are, if the patient's been shocked, what the CPR values are. Uh, it does you know, readiness checks, prints out scripts, uh, has multiple screen options that we can use for diagnostics. It's uh, changing, the technology changes so rapidly um, sure. What's what's the protocol with the uh, paramedic that uh, comes out of Huggins? I mean, do they respond to all the emergencies? Does the paramedic have this equipment on board as well? So um, both Stewarts and Wolfboro um, have basic EMTs, advanced EMTs, and paramedics. We only we have one paramedic that is on our department. So we would do not consider ourselves a paramedic service. They provide all the paramedic services for Huggins Hospital. They don't respond to all calls, but they do respond to the higher acuity calls. So if a patient is unconscious, a cardiac patient, stroke, STEMI, any of those kind of uh, high acuity calls, we'd automatically get a paramedic to respond to the scene and we would work collectively as a team. If our group arrives first, they would be the person who would uh, apply this equipment. Or if there was a second patient or a second call, we were you know, in it waiting for the ambulance or, or vice versa. Our personnel have to know how to use the equipment because they have to assist a paramedic in doing a 12 lead uh, tracing of a patient. And so we have to have the, we have to have the equipment uh, available for that. And uh, it, it's, it's also a backup too. Uh, they're, ba they're operated by battery, um, they're, uh, capable of uh, also, you know, charging the batteries that we have. And uh, I'm sorry, the other thing I, I, I would say is that these units can be used by basics, advanced and paramedics. So you don't have to be a paramedic to use this device, but to use it as a manual device, you have to be a paramedic, but the automatic features of the defibrillator, both the basic and the advanced providers can use that. The EKG, uh, self-interprets, but it's always verified by a paramedic if they're on scene, if they're not on scene. Those who can't interpret those, some of the rhythms, there's some rhythms that a basic and advanced can interpret, and some that uh, it would require a paramedic or obviously a physician. In those cases, the, the uh, device does do uh, a uh, diagnostic, which can be sent to the hospital. So it's very, uh, w w one of the things that this is really important for is if someone's having, for example, chest pain, and uh, they are in, in need of going to a cath lab, like at Portsmouth or Concord Hospital, we, the earlier that that's detected, the more likely the person has for uh, survivability. There's a time frame where a patient begins to have chest pain and when they need to arrive at a, a definitive care facility. And uh, when I say definitive care, our hospital is a wonderful hospital and they can provide a certain level of care, but you know, most of those patients need to go to a cath lab, which is manned with the staffing that's capable of doing, you know, uh, you know uh, putting stents in, basically. And uh, so that's one of the chief things that we can derive from this is the ability to get that early detection that someone's had an MI, a myocardial infarction, and that they can get treatment sooner than later. Chief, Thank I have you, a question Chief. for you. Um, of your five, 858 medical rescue calls annually, how many in the last year have you had to use your current cardiac monitor defibrillator? I couldn't hear the question. I'm sorry. Of your 858 medical rescue calls annually, how many times have you, uh, has the fire department had to use the cardiac monitor uh, in the last year? The one you have currently. So, 
So okay, every patient. How many times you use it, basically? So because the device is used for uh, a wide variety of diagnostics, anything from basically getting a person's blood pressure all the way up to, you know, defibrillation and capnography. It's kind of a tough, I, I don't really have any kind of a data sheet that would say how many times we did a specific diagnostic, but I can say that almost every patient that gets transported uses some, there's some form of a diagnostics on that device that are used either by the fire department or by stewards and supported by the other agency at the same, you know, as they arrive and are, are working together as a team. So it's used, you know, the goal would be to get the vital signs and, uh, you know, diagnostics on every single patient that we uh, treat or that stewards transports. Do they have a machine that does not quite as complete a, a job as the one you're asking for now? Do they have a, a, a newer version of what you have now without quite so many things that it does? At a I don't think cost? so. I think that you would find it's very, uh, if not identical, very, very similar in what its capabilities are. Mr. Chairman, may I? Yes, sir, go ahead. Um, the chief has marked this as urgent. Um, I concur with that statement. And the reason is this machine falls within the standard of care, which his providers are providing to our community. Um, if he does not have this machine on his piece of apparatus. There will not be a cardiac monitor on that piece of apparatus, which means that his staff who is trained to provide um, drugs to various medical events is not going to happen. Um, so this is, while it is an expensive tool, um, it falls within the, the standard of care for his providers. And I, I think the urgency of this um, is high. Um, additionally, the unit he is replacing, I believe is significantly older. Um, I, I wanna say it's, it's closer to 15 years old. And that machine, uh, the town of Wolfboro also uh, received under a um, assistant to firefighters grant, um, which was well before my time, but that's how that machine came to be in Wolfboro. Um, well expensive, I think that this, um, this is an important capital outlay. Okay, uh, any more discussion on this uh, capital outlay request uh, from the fire department for the cardiac monitor defibrillator? I appreciate the uh, town manager's point of view on it. I, I don't agree with it all. I think that the, the steward ambulances that the town provides, uh, I mean, that everybody goes to the incidences uh, fire, police, and steward. I think it's a lot of overlap, and I'm not in favor of it. It's just my opinion. Okay, uh, thank you. So, uh, does anyone have any motion concerning this request? Okay, I'll step up and I'll do a motion to uh, approve this request for capital outlay uh, for the defibrillator cardiac monitor. Is there a second? Second. Okay, uh, the chief had contacted me when he was working on this and I tried to get us some state funding 
uh, due to the CARES Act and the COVID issues and all that. And unfortunately, we were we were short getting that. Uh, and he, had, the chief, gave me some pretty heartfelt uh, conversation about how important this was to our community, and uh, especially the folks that have heart issues and uh, maybe lung issues and things like that. So. Uh, I think it's a, a valuable piece of equipment to have a, have in the town and have on the truck. Uh, it's just unfortunate that we were able to get some support from the state to offset this cost, uh, but this is the way it is. So, uh, any other any other discussion on this? Yeah, yeah. John. Yes. I, I would say I, I would consider this extremely important as well, uh, not just for our residents, but for the guests that we get in the summer. Uh, you know, we have to have this ability. I mean, if this saves one life, it seems worth it. It's gonna save more than one is what I would think. And it's gonna make a difference to a lot of people, so. Uh, thank you, Matt. Uh, uh, John, also. Yes. Um, as many of you know, I was I've been on the receiving end, um, and I would agree uh, it's, uh, you know, uh, it's whoever's there first, I want to have the equipment uh, necessary to uh, help keep me going. Um, I know uh, sometimes uh, if Stuart uh, is, is off on another call or if they're doing a transport or if they've got a manpower issue, uh, they might not always be the first ones there. Um, be nice if there were some uh, a grant money available to help offset the cost, but uh, yeah, unfortunately, we, we've got to keep it uh, up to the, up to date. Uh, thank you, Brian. Uh, any other comments or discussion? Okay, seeing none, a hearing then. I'll do a roll call vote uh, again. This is for two. Uh, Approve the fire department capital request for uh, $32,800, which is for a cardiac monitor defibrillator. Uh, Bob Tuffer? Yes. John Burt? Yes. Uh, Matt Flash? Yes. Uh, Brian Black? Yes. Uh, Steve Johnson? No. And uh, John McDonald votes yes. Uh, the motion passes. Okay, do we have anything else to do tonight, Chief? Are you all set? Thank you very much. Okay. And I'll get those figures for you uh, immediately uh, on the bidding uh, numbers. I'll find out who that company is in Portsmouth and uh, get a hold of them. Okay, if you, need me, if you need me to send you the information, just let me know, okay? I'll be back in touch with you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, let's see where we are now, folks. I think we're... Uh, Ready to discuss the uh, revisit to the Public Works Department. What do folks have for questions on the Public Works Department? Yeah, John. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Yeah, I guess I guess I can open this up. So um, early on in the uh, budget season, we had a um, a meeting. Uh, which uh, we found out was a joint meeting with the Board of Selectmen regarding a reorganization uh, to the Department of Public Works. Um, we didn't get a lot of information up front. And what we did get up front, we got it uh, within days of, uh, of the meeting. So um, we, we were presented all the information. We went through the budgets. The budgets were completely different. I still don't understand what's going on completely. And we have uh, an Excel spreadsheet here uh, that um, differentiates between the current public works management and the proposed public works management. And uh, the, it has uh, salaries, benefits, and we noticed that under the new proposed public works management, 
we would, when this uh, reorganization was complete, we would incur an additional ex expense and benefits package or multiple packages of $137,000 added to the budget. Now, I spoke with four other members of this committee myself, personally, and everyone I spoke with, and myself included, we all feel that the format is very good. Because the format under this reorganization syncs up the Department of Public Works with the rest of the departments in town. You have a director, you have an assistant director, and then you have staff in a chain of command. Everybody I spoke with, and myself, we were very leery of one thing. And that one thing we were leery of is the open-ended salary commitment to day four going forward at his, at his current salary. And this is, why, this is why I brought it up, because it was brought to my attention by everybody I spoke with. And that's why I wanted to revisit it. I have a couple of ideas of how to work with this. I would like to personally table the whole thing and come back to and visit it next year because I would like to have some time to work this whole thing out in our off season. That's, that's my pleasure. The bottom line is I don't want to hurt Dave Floyd in any way, shape or form, but I do not believe the, um, the reorganization as presented to us uh, should go that way. And I, I can present uh, my ideas. Uh, uh, another thing I want to say is that we're, we're kind of short-staffed here tonight as far as uh, our membership, and I, I would really not like to make any m m decisions tonight without a full crew. So, um, but uh, I, I would like the other people to weigh in on this, and I do have some options that I've been banging around in my head, so. So, that's it for me right now. Okay, thank you, Bob. Let's, let's not think of this as a person, as, a, as an individual or whatever. Let's think of it as a, who's ever in that position is, no matter who it is, this is the right thing to do for the town. Uh, not, not based on who the person is or, or things like that. Uh, so w what are you suggesting that you want to do that you're recommending you want to try to do, Bob, I guess? Could you just kind of define that a little bit better? Well, I have, uh, I, I thought of uh, three ideas, and, and one is contingent, contingent on, on a couple questions I have for the town manager, but uh, w one idea I have, if we wanted to revert back to uh, the 2020 budget, would be to just completely redo the Department of Public Works budget, similar to a default budget where you would level fund everything except your necessary additions and subtractions, which is pretty much what we do every year with a budget anyway. To me, that's the most drastic option. Uh, and uh, you know, I think we can work around that, but that's my first idea. Uh, my second idea is to locate, now I'm not sure actually if there is a, um, there's a note at the bottom of this Excel spreadsheet to do a warrant article to hire a new public works director for half a year at 68,670, but only $9,442 uh, needed from taxation. Now, uh, what I don't know and what I would like to know, and maybe Jim Pinio can help me out, is um, that, that, is, that new public works director for half a year, is there money in the budget for that right now, in, in our budget lines in the DPW? So this is where it gets very confusing, and that is because the transfer of percentages to the various enterprise funds um, to account for the responsibilities of um, the existing staff. Um, we felt that this was a good year to do that based on the debt service that was falling off in those enterprise funds. Um, so we could essentially absorb that with zero impact 
on the taxpayers and bring in a new director of public works that would oversee highway garage, buildings and grounds and solid waste for that half a year um, at the number that you've alluded to. Is there money in the budget to do that now? So the way the budget is proposed right now, yes. Okay, so if this committee decided to use that option, could you identify those lines for us so we could lower them? So the, the lines for the new position, is that what you're asking? Yes, if, if this committee decided uh, they did not want to fund this hiring this year, all I'm asking is, can you identify those lines for us so we can make, so we can pull back the, the funding? So, so the new position lines are as follows. 014310 slash 113 in the amount of $47,760. Line item 01431102303500 Line item 01431102303500 one one zero two three zero six thousand four hundred and thirty three dollars and line item zero one four one five five zero two one zero twelve thousand seven hundred and fifty one dollars and that would be for a total of $68,445. Thank you. Now, my third option is to do nothing and uh, just uh, leave it be. And uh, I, I, the people I spoke with, I don't think would be happy with that. I'm, I'm not happy with that. And uh, so, so I'll, I'll kick it back to you, John, you know, uh, to get some other comments on that. Okay, thank you. Again, we've got, we're going to have two positions that are getting paid out of two different departments. Is that correct, Jim? So Mr. Ford's uh, position will be um, divided up amongst general fund, water fund, sewer fund. Um, I guess if I could just stop you there, why, why should that particular position and why should anyone have to participate in paying that in the general fund if he's no longer doing anything with public works? Oh, he's absolutely going to be doing items with public works. Um, we, any engineering or any um, permitting jobs um, would, would absolutely f still fall under um, Mr. Ford's purview. Okay, thank you. We, we have, we, we've identified over the past uh, several years that um, the, the process of, of permitting is taking more and more time of, of days, um, and you can't, we, we, we really can't do a whole lot without permitting, and permitting it often en requires engineering, and uh, this, is, this is the items that Dave does well, um, and that's where we want him to focus his efforts. Okay, let's talk about the other person uh, that's also going to be the, uh, whatever, whoever it's going to be, going to be the assistant superintendent of the waterworks, if that's the correct title. Yeah, so that, that individual has, uh, he would be the, the assistant director. That individual has the uh, required certifications to operate our water and sewer systems at the level um, that we're currently operating. Um, we are working on um, training staff to get to a, a better level, um, but right now um, that other individual is the only one that is qualified to operate 
um, the plants at the level we're operating. Okay, if he's the only one that can do that, and that's going to be his job, water and sewer, why should he be getting paid money out of the general fund for the highway department? Uh, going forward, he won't be. He's listed on my, my thing as getting paid. Uh, Mr. Pike? Yes. Yeah, uh, for the first six months, absolutely. After that six month Zero. period, he transitions to um, the enterprise funds exclusively. Uh, remember, all of, all of this stuff is, is taking um, the status quo for the first six months, and then July 1, um, we make the transition to the new model. Okay, does anyone else have any questions? Yeah, I have a question. Yes, Steve. Uh, the question would be uh, where we're going to change the department heads and the uh, the model to date has been um, for the current public works director to be uh, paid out of a number of different funds, and yet we're making this change in reorganization to presumably boost morale, of public works, and so on, um, and and give the current uh, model of current department head more time to do, uh, concentrate on water, sewer, and so on and so forth. Um, but the salary is still the same. So I'm wondering, uh, we're reducing the responsibility, but not reducing the, the salary. And yet we're creating a um, uh, public works director for uh, highway and so on. Uh, so it just, I just wonder about how we're doing that. And I understand now that with uh, what the town manager said, as far as he'll still, uh, uh, Dave will still be doing uh, some uh, public works things and so on. It just. If, you, if nothing's going to change uh, and it keeps the same salary, why don't we just leave it the way it is? I mean, it, I, don't, I don't know what we're accomplishing here uh, unless this is a, like a, a one, two year, three year plan where we want to make a change slowly and we want to keep Dave for his expertise and so on. So uh, that's just an open question. Uh, I, 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 don't, I don't get, usually when you reduce someone's responsibilities, there's a reduction in salary. Yep. If you increase someone's responsibilities and so on, you increase their salary. Yep. So I'm, 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 I'm having a tough time with that whole thing, especially in this year of we're uh, in a tight budget, uh, we're over and so on. So, um, Very fair question and, and my, my counter argument to that would be um, that over the 13 years that Mr. Ford's been here, um, his responsibilities have um, skyrocketed without any relief. Um, so I, I am of the opinion that, and is Taylor and Howard, the report that was submitted, um, it's not sustainable. We, we have we've crossed a threshold. Um, Dave was hired to do a, a certain job. Um, that occurred, and um, it, it, we simply can't maintain that model anymore. Um, so that's why we're, we're coming forward with this um, to reorganize and provide uh, what we feel is going to be a much more efficient um, model of business, and it's going to improve the quality of the projects. I approve of the, the uh, reorganization. Uh, I'm just I'm not in favor of where we're having a lesser responsibility to maintain that. And you're saying that he, because of the job that he's done so well to this point, uh, but he's been also rewarded by a, a, a salary commencement with that uh, with that task as well. So. Uh, I, I don't think I said that, but I, I, I do 
believe that Mr. Ford um, has been asked to do more than is within his job description, and he always does it. Okay. And those types of things at this point, um, in my opinion, um, and again in Tata and Howard report, um, aren't sustainable, and um, we're just looking at a, a more efficient model. Thank you. Can I, uh, can I just ahead, make Matt. sure I understand? Uh, so there are two departments, public works and water and sewer. And right now, they, there's one department head running both. Is that what's happening now? So, so right now, um, there essentially are multiple divisions that are under Dave's authority. Mm -hmm. um, he operates all of those divisions under water, uh, where there's two, uh, sewer, where there are two, and public works, where there are five, I believe it is. Okay. Um, so the, the chart that you received shows that um, essentially what we're looking at is breaking Dave out with water sewer. And again, he would 20% of his time, we would like to be able to spend on those permitting those large projects. A um, couple of examples, town docks, um, Route 28 project, which is gonna be coming um, down the road in a couple years. A lot of our road projects require um, not only engineering, but it's, it requires water sewer upgrades. So to marry um, those together uh, seems to make a lot of sense. And we can, at that point, have our director of public works, the new position, focus more on that road maintenance um, and keeping the, the streets mm -hmm. clean, keeping the equipment operating, and keeping the manpower moving. And, but it sounds like the position is being tailored <coughs> a certain way because of Dave's expertise. And that someday in the future, it will change again if Dave ever retires uh, so I, I don't know if that's necessarily the case. I, I will sit here and say that, um, it, at least from what I, I've been able to observe, you know, Dave's subject matter expertise is the water sewer system, mm -hmm. um, the RIB site. He does well with roads, um, but he can't continue to have this stuff continue to be piled on. So we're looking at this, okay, how do we stop <coughs> the piling on of work? And that is to have him focus on our water sewer. In 2017, we had asset management reports that came out and told us point blank, you've got to be doing this, 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 and this. And we've struggled to do that. And mm -hmm. the focus going forward is to focus on those asset management plans. Um, for water and sewer. We've got a road surface management plan uh, for the highway. Uh, so th those, are, those are some things that we're looking at, at taking advantage of. Any more? Yes, uh, Jim. Go ahead. What I would like to know is, as I look at this uh, salary chart here, do we all think that Dave Ford's salary as a, as a director of public works is commensurate with a, uh, a sal what a, what a, with what a salary should be for a public works director? We've, we're creating a scenario where David Ford is going to be making tens of thousands of dollars more than the town manager. Okay, let's not let's just f not focus on the okay. person, but the position. May, okay. May I? Well, may I, I Mr. Tuffer? May I, I? Hold on just a second. John, can I just finish? Yeah, go ahead. We're creating a, we're creating a situation where which could be uh, not good for uh, morale with other department heads and the town manager who, who is making less than than Dave Ford. It it has to be addressed. Jim, did you want to say something? I would. Um, first of all, um, 
I'm quite sure that Mr. Ford, as a professional engineer out in the private sector, would be working, making significantly more money than he is with the town of Wolfboro right now. Number two, um, and I, I'm just going to say this, I know what I signed up for when I came to work in this town manager's office. I knew what Dave Ford was making for his salary when I came into this position as town manager. Um, so for it to be stated that there could be some animosity related to that, um, I, I respectfully think you're out of line. Um, I, I know what that is. I knew what I signed up for when I took this position, and I compare myself to myself and nobody else. Um, Thank you, Jim. And I will leave it at that um, because I think the, the statement regarding morale, um, that, that's a very slippery slope, and I'll leave that one alone. Okay, let's just, let's just focus on the decision whether you want to fund a public works director and do some reorganization where we'll have a public works director and Mr. Ford will give up whatever percentage of that job and go to do his other things, his uh, water and sewer projects. So let's focus on that. Is there any motions concerning uh, the new position, the requested new position? John, I, I wouldn't do anything tonight without a uh, without a full group. So is that a motion to table it for now? Yeah, I, I you know you know half half of us are not here, so I, I don't think this is a good time to be uh, talking about this. You know, if it, okay. it just uh, it doesn't make any sense to me. That's all. Now, I really well, I'll leave it at that. Okay, there's a motion to table it for this evening. Is there a second? I'll second that. I'm sorry, John? I second the motion. I second that, okay. Any further discussion? Okay, this should be a roll call vote. Just a question. Yes. Um, is the intent uh, to table it um, to another budget season, or is it uh, the intent to uh, table it uh, to another uh, meeting during this season? It, it's my understanding, if I'm, Bob, please correct me if I'm incorrect, that we'll bring this up at another meeting, probably when we do the outboard motor question. Yeah, that, that's, the, well, we have a budget, we have a final review coming up, so I, I figured uh, that, that that could be a spot too. Okay. All right, thank you. Did you, you understand that? You did answer your question, Brian? Yeah, yeah, that, that, that did. I don't want to uh, table this for another uh, budget season. I'm, I'm fine with tabling it again for another meeting uh, during this season. Okay. Uh, John, any more discussion? I, I'm, yeah. I'm wondering, who, so what, is, what exactly are we tabling? The discussion concerning the, or the uh, decision concerning the Department of Public Works new position. Is that is that fair representation, Bob, in your motion? Yeah, that's good. Okay. So it we just it's just the discussion of whether or not to hire a new director. New public works director, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, Okay. Okay, uh, do we have any more questions? Okay, seeing none, or hearing none, there's going to be a roll call vote. Uh, Bob Tuffer? Yes. John Burt? Yes. Uh, Matt Plash? Yes. Uh, Brian Black? Yes. Steve Johnson? Yes. And John McDonald votes yes. The motion passes. Hey, John? Yes. 
Uh, uh, Jim Tinio, would you kindly of email, email us out those lines and those numbers that you gave me, please? They will be in your inbox tomorrow morning. Thank you. Okay, I don't see anything further. Water and sewer, uh, we all set on that. It's going to be part of the other discussion, I take it. That is correct. Uh, we have no minutes to consider. Any other business? I'd like to say pledge allegiance next to the next meeting. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. <laughs> I, ap I apologize. Hey, it's a great country we live in, and we should be pledge allegiance. To the I realize. It's, I realize it's a great country. Believe me. Uh, Besides which, we need some lemonade. <laughs> Okay, I guess if there's nothing further, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion. And a second? Second. Okay, this will be a roll call vote. Uh, Bob Tuffer? Yes. John Burrett? Yes. Uh, Matt Plash? Yes. Uh, Brian Black? Yes. Steve Johnson? Yes. John McDonough votes yes. I just want to thank everyone for coming to the meeting so close to Christmas, and I hope everyone has a Merry Christmas and a Happy Holiday, and we'll see you after Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry, Merry Christmas, Christmas, everyone. Thanks.